much for having me. Um, certainly, uh, my publisher could not have hoped for a more timely release um, of this book. Um, I started working on this in the wake of the Kavanaugh hearings when I, I thought about, you know, how do we get here? Is there any way to fix it? Um, those sorts of questions. And um, I'd like to start talking about about this, about the book, about this issue by um, conveying a vignette from just over 50 years ago, I guess almost 60 years ago now, when Justice Charles Evans Whitaker retired in March 1962 after just over five years on the court, John F. Kennedy had his first opportunity to shape the high court. The youthful president picked a man of his own generation, Byron White, right? The, the uh, inaugural address by JFK, the torch has been passed to a new generation. Uh, White had met JFK in England while on a Rhodes Scholarship after having been runner-up for the Heisman Trophy and spending a year as the highest paid player in the NFL. And the two became friends. Uh, White was 45 and serving as uh, the Deputy Attorney General under Robert F. Kennedy. Um, he was formally nominated April 3rd, 1962, and uh, eight days later had his hearing most of which was uh, testimonials by bar association officials. There was about 15 minutes of questions for the nominee, mostly about his storied football career. Um, Byron White was surely the last person to play a professional sport while attending Yale Law School. The Judiciary Committee unanimously approved him, and later that day, so did the Senate uh, on a voice vote. Times have changed. The battle to confirm Brett Kavanaugh showed that the Supreme Court is now part of the same toxic cloud that envelops all of the nation's public discourse. Ironically, Kavanaugh was nominated in part because he was thought to be a safe pick with a long public career that had been vetted numerous times. He was firmly part of the legal establishment, specifically its conservative mainstream, and had displayed a political caginess that made and still make some on the right worry that he would be too much like John Roberts rather than Antonin Scalia or Clarence Thomas. As it turned out, of course, 11th hour sexual assault allegations transformed what was already a contentious process into a partisan Rorschach test. All told, Kavanaugh faced a smear campaign unlike any seen since Robert Bork. Senate Democrats had warned President Reagan that nominating Bork this is back in 1987 when Bork had been a judge on the D.C. Circuit after a storied academic and government career. Uh, but they had warned uh, Reagan that nominating Bork would provoke a fight unlike any he had faced, even after Justice Scalia had been confirmed unanimously the year before, in part because the Republicans still controlled the Senate at that time. But anyway, on the very day that Reagan nevertheless announced Bork as his pick, Senator Ted Kennedy went to the Senate floor to denounce Robert Bork's America, really kind of a, a calumny of uh, nightmare scenarios of what would happen if uh, Bork joined the court. It went downhill from there, as the brusque Bork refused to adopt the now well-worn strategy of talking a lot without saying anything. He wanted to score debaters' points, really, uh, more than gain votes. A few years later, Ruth Bader Ginsburg refined that tactic into a pincer movement, refusing to comment on specific fact patterns because they might come before the court, and then also refusing to discuss general constitutional principles because a judge could deal in specifics only. Confirmation processes weren't always like this. The Senate didn't even hold public hearings on Supreme Court nominations until 1916, which was a tumultuous year that witnessed the first Jewish nominee, also a, a big social crusader, uh, Louis Brandeis, uh, and also, after Brandeis was ultimately confirmed, the resignation of a justice to run against a sitting president. In 1916, pretty, pretty controversial political year. It wouldn't be until 1938 that a nominee testified at his own hearing. And as I said, in 1962, the part of White's hearing where he himself testified lasted about 15 minutes. But while the process may not have always been the spectacle that it is today, nominations to the highest court were often contentious political struggles. For the Republic's first century, confirmation battles, including withdrawn and postponed nominations, are those on which the Senate failed to act. So Merrick Garland was by no means unprecedented. Uh, that sort of thing was a fairly regular occurrence. George Washington had a Chief Justice nominee rejected by the Senate. James Madison had a nominee rejected. And John Quincy Adams, who himself had declined a nomination for Madison, uh, 
had a nominee, quote unquote, postponed indefinitely. Uh, gotta love that euphemism for Senate procedure. Uh, Andrew Jackson, uh, who then beat uh, John Quincy Adams, had a nominee thwarted as, as well, but a change in the Senate allowed Roger Taney to become Chief Justice later and eventually author Dred Scott. John Tyler, who assumed the presidency in 1841 after the one month presidency of William Henry Harrison, remember he caught pneumonia at his very long inaugural address. So uh, Tyler never lived down his nickname of his accidency. He was kind of a political orphan uh, Whigs disputed his legitimacy, and their policy disagreements extended to nominations. The Senate rejected or declined to act on four Tyler nominees, three of them twice, before finally confirming one. Most 19th century presidents had trouble filling seats on the high court. And in the 20th century, Presidents Harding, Hoover, Eisenhower, Johnson, Nixon, and Reagan all had failed nominations. FDR never had anyone rejected, although his court packing plan was uh, both in Congress and at the polls. The Democrats ended up losing 80 seats in the House and eight in the Senate, even though FDR had been reelected overwhelmingly uh, two years earlier. And LBJ's proposed elevation of Justice Abe Fortas led to the only successful filibuster of a S Supreme Court nominee. Although there's a dispute over whether you can call it a filibuster uh, because Fortas never even had a majority of pledged votes. And there was bipartisan opposition as well. Douglas Ginsburg withdrew before President Reagan could formally send his name to the Senate for having smoked marijuana with his law students. I consider him to be the last public casualty of the drug war. If you think about it in the last 30 years, what other public official has uh, suffered for a revelation of drug use? Then of course, there's Merrick Garland, the first nomination the Senate allowed to expire since 1881. But then the last time a Senate controlled by a party opposite to the president confirmed a nominee to a vacancy arising in a presidential election year was 1888. As we now know, uh, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell's gamble worked. Not only did it not hurt vulnerable senators running for reelection, but the vacancy held Republicans together and provided the margin for Donald Trump in key states. Trump then rewarded his electoral coalition with the nomination of Neil Gorsuch who was confirmed only after the Senate decided on a party line vote to exercise the nuclear option and remove filibusters. Now, opportunities for obstruction have continued, pushed down to blue slips and cloture votes and other arcane parliamentary procedures, even as control of the Senate remains by far the most important aspect of the whole endeavor. The elimination of the filibuster for Supreme Court nominees was the natural culmination of a tit for tat escalation by both parties. More significantly, by filibustering Gorsuch, Democrats destroyed their leverage over more consequential vacancies. Moderate Republican senators wouldn't have gone for a nuclear option to seat Kavanaugh in place of Anthony Kennedy, but they didn't face that dilemma. And they're not facing it now, uh, which if President Trump gets to replace Justice Ginsburg would be an even bigger shift. Given the battles we saw over Gorsuch and Kavanaugh, too many people now think of the justices in partisan terms. That's too bad, but not a surprise when contrasting methods of constitutional and statutory interpretation largely track identification with parties that are more ideologically sorted than ever. But why is there all this focus on one office, however high? If uh, Secretary of State John Kerry had died or resigned in the last year of the Obama presidency, or you know, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo now, it certainly would have been a big deal but there's no doubt that the slot would have been filled if someone with appropriate credentials were nominated. Even a vacancy in the vice presidency wouldn't have lasted unduly long. But of course, executive appointments expire at the end of the presidential term, while judicial appointments usually outlast any president. A president has few constitutional powers more important than appointing judges. Justice Scalia served nearly 30 years on the high court, giving President Reagan's legal agenda a bridge to the 21st century. Four years ago, there was a big ruling on nonprofit donor disclosures, an issue very important to Cato's heart, probably to Georgetown's Constitution Center as well. But anyway, this ruling was made by a district judge appointed by Lyndon Johnson. Might as well be Andrew Johnson, right? Ancient history has been there forever. Pundits always argue that judicial nominations should be among voters' primary considerations when choosing a president. Well, the Supreme Court's future truly did hang in the balance in 2016. The election was so consequential in part because people knew that its winner would have the first chance in more than 25 years 
to shift the court's ideological balance. Indeed, the court now stands starkly split five to four on many issues, campaign finance, the Second Amendment, religious liberty, regulatory power, just to name a few. If Hillary Clinton had been able to appoint a progressive jurist, even a moderate one like Garland, those policy areas would be headed in a substantially different direction. And that goes just as much, if not more, for the lower courts, which decide 50,000 cases annually, even as the Supreme Court hears fewer and fewer. Every four-year term, the president appoints about a fifth of the judiciary. On Inauguration Day in January 2017, there were already 105 vacancies, and that rose to more than 150 before a tweak in Senate debate sped up confirmations. To put another way, when Obama took office, one of the 13 appellate circuit courts had a majority of judges appointed by Democrats. After his 55 appointments, nine did. Trump has partly reversed that, flipping three circuits and getting a record 30 circuit judges confirmed in his first two years, about the same number as Bush and Obama combined at that point in their presidencies, and 53 overall, better than anyone in one term except Jimmy Carter, for whom Congress created many new judgeships to fill, kind of as a consolation for not having any Supreme Court vacancies on his watch. Even if politics has always been part of the process, and even if more justices were rejected in our country's first century than its second, we still feel something is now different. Confirmation hearings are the only time that judges go toe to toe with politicians. And that's definitely a different gauntlet than even President Tyler's nominees ran. So is it all TV and Twitter, the 24 hour news cycle and the viral video? Is it that legal issues have become more ideologically divisive? No, the uh, nomination and confirmation process and interplay among president, Senate and outside stakeholders hasn't somehow changed beyond the framers' recognition. And political rhetoric was as nasty in 1820 as it was in 2020. If you Google uh, a campaign video, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, they took the pamphlets from that election and made them as if they were modern um, campaign uh, ads. It's kind of funny stuff, but very, uh, uh, you know, not for the faint of heart. Even the novel use of filibusters is anything but. Uh, all these parts of the current system that we don't like are symptoms of a much larger phenomenon. As government has grown, so have the laws that courts interpret and their reach over ever more of our lives. Senatorial brinksmanship is symptomatic of a larger problem that began long before Kavanaugh, Garland, Thomas, or even Bork. And that's the court's self-corruption, aiding and abetting the expansion of federal power then shifting that power away from the people's legislative representatives and toward executive branch administrative agencies. And the Supreme Court is also called upon to decide, often by a one vote margin, massive social controversies, ranging from abortion and affirmative action to gun rights and same-sex marriage. The judiciary affects public policy more than it ever did. And those decisions increasingly turn on the party of the president who nominated the judge and justice. So as the courts play more of a role in the political process, of course, the judicial nomination and confirmation processes are going to be more fraught with partisan considerations. This wasn't as much of a problem when partisanship meant rewarding your cronies, but it's a modern phenomenon for our parties to be both ideologically sorted and polarized, and thus for judges nominated by presidents from different parties to have markedly different constitutional visions. Is there anything we can do to fix this dynamic, to turn down the political heat on Supreme Court vacancies? Reform proposals abound. There's term limits, changing the size of the court, setting new rules for the confirmation process, uh, and more. Probably term limits are the most common ones that are pro uh, proposed. I actually had an op-ed uh, this week, uh, yesterday it came out, lifetime ago at this point, um, in the Atlantic, uh, talking about and uh, modestly endorsing the idea of uh, uh, term limits, um, not because it would change how the court operated or any of this power dynamic that I've described, but at least there would be regularity to when there would be vacancies and we wouldn't have um, this kind of arbitrary um, uh, situation of when vacancies arose or uh, justices trying to uh, time their retirements for politically opportune moments or these morbid death watches uh, for octogenarian justices. With an 18 year term, you would have uh, two vacancies for every 
uh, presidential term. Um, certainly the court <clears throat> would become more of a part of Senate and presidential races, um, but uh, that's probably better than kind of what we're living right at this moment uh, right now. Uh, the problem is it would take a constitutional amendment. And so um, if we had the political unity for a constitutional amendment, maybe we wouldn't have the underlying toxicity in the first place. But, you know, that might do something at least for public confidence, if not the functioning of the court. Other proposals, you know, restructuring, adding justices or, you know, adding some and then designating some as Republicans and some as Democrats and then having some quote unquote neutrals. Um, you know, these are too clever by half and they would further politicize the court, really. They're not solving that problem. As far as court packing is concerned, uh, this is one of the few issues on which I, maybe the only one on which I agree with Bernie Sanders. When he was asked about court packing, he said, well, if we do that, then the next time Republicans take power, they'll add more justices. And I'm not gonna do the accent, but in 50 years, we're gonna have 87 justices. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, Joe Biden, by the way, also uh, was one of the few uh, primary contenders in the Democratic uh, presidential race, uh, in addition to Sanders, not to endorse court packing, although he might be pressured into it if, uh, if the Democrats win uh, uh, both the Senate and the White House in, uh, in this election. As one court watcher wrote a quarter century ago, Today's confirmation battles are no longer government affairs between the president and the Senate. They're public affairs open to a broad range of players, thus overt lobbying, public opinion polls, advertising campaigns, focus groups, and public appeals have all become a routine part of the process. Those trends have only accelerated such that Supreme Court nominations are perhaps the highest profile set pieces in the American political system. Not even set pieces, but months long slogs. Once the inside game of picking the nominee ends, the outside game begins, culminating in the literally made-for-TV hearings uh, and then a, uh, a vote that, as we learned with Justice Kavanaugh, can be just as dramatic. It's not good, but we've gotten here because Congress and the presidency have gradually taken more power for themselves and the Supreme Court has allowed them to get away with it, aggrandizing itself in the process. As the court has let both the legislative and executive branches swell between, uh, beyond their constitutionally authorized powers, so have the laws and regulations that it now interprets. As we've gone down that warped jurisprudential track, the judiciary affects the direction of public policy more than ever. So of course, again, I mentioned this before, judicial co confirmations will be fraught because we're at the culmination of several trends where competing interpretive theories map onto political parties that are more ideologically coherent than ever. And that's also why the judicial nomination process was, uh, is more cognizant of partisan considerations. Um, as the response of the conservative legal movement to various judicial provocations has shifted, the debate over the court's posture has crystallized. From calls for restraint in the face of the Warren courts making up social policy, out of whole cloth, which ultimately led to too much deference to the political branches and thus a long-term loss for constitutional governance, the focus now is on engaging with the law. That approach often calls for in invalidating the laws being reviewed rather than exercising passive virtues. Indeed, activism has become a vacuous term that conveys nothing more than disagreement with the judge or opinion being criticized. So the battle has been joined over the legal theory rather than judicial process. That is, so long as we accept that judicial review is constitutional and appropriate, and how a judiciary is supposed to ensure that the government secures and protects our liberties without it is beyond me, then we should be concerned only that a court gets it right, regardless of whether that correct interpretation leads to the challenge law being upheld or overturned. To paraphrase Neil Gorsuch at his confirmation hearing, the little guy should win when he's in the right and the big corporation should win when it's in the right. And so the dividing line isn't between judicial activism and restraint, but between legitimate and vigorous judicial engagement and illegitimate judicial imperialism or abdication. It's a generational battle. Do you get into the fight over federalism and the separation of powers, or do you sit back and let the political branches handle that sort of thing, preferring not to mess up your judicial robes? And that gets us back to the debate over the administrative state, deference doctrines, congressional delegation of legislative power, and even more arcane areas of regulatory law, which is why judicial selection is so consequential. 
as uh, former White House counsel Don McGahn put it, if you get the administrative stuff right, everything else will fall into place. In the event, the court we were accustomed to with one or two human jumps between separate ideological blocks is over. The court is moving right, if only incrementally. While Chief Justice Roberts now has even more incentive to indulge his minimalist fantasies and lead the court from the squishy commanding heights, he's a far surer vote for conservatives, maybe not libertarians, than Justice Kennedy was. What that means in the long term, time will only tell. Though, of course, Roberts is only in the middle of the court if uh, a Democratic president gets to replace Justice Ginsburg. If uh, President Trump gets to confirm someone for that vacancy, then, um, you know, well, this war that we're about to live could make the, the Bork, Thomas, and Kavanaugh processes look like those old school same day confirmations. But the judicial debates we've seen the last few decades were never really about the nominees themselves just like proposals for court packing and the like aren't about good government. They're about the direction of the court. The left in particular needs its social and regulatory agendas as promulgated by the executive branch to get through the judiciary because uh, they wouldn't pass as legislation at the national level. That's why progressive forces pull out all the stops against originalist nominees who'd enforce limits on federal power. Indeed, all of the big nominee blowups in modern times since that bipartisan opposition to Abe Fortas in 1968 have come with Republican appointments. The one quasi-exception didn't involve any attacks on the nominee, but the rare case of an election year vacancy arising under divided government, Merrick Garland, um, who would have been confirmed had Scalia died a year earlier. Not that any of this is a good thing. Uh, former Solicitor General Don Verrilli said, I really, really don't like where we are right now, Something needs to be done to change the situation. If nominations were depoliticized, whether through term limits or any other reforms, or some unpredictable shock that recalibrated norms, that would likewise depoliticize the exercise of judicial power, both in perception and reality. But as I said, term limits would take a constitutional amendment, and everything else is either completely unworkable or doesn't actually solve the identified problem. We can't just wave a magic wand and go back to some halcyon age where the issues we faced were all different. Ron Klain, who was the former chief of staff to Vice Presidents Gore and Biden and would likely be a significant player in a Biden administration, uh, he said, uh, if they could truly, truly go back, I hear from most senators that they would prefer a return to the pre-nuclear option days. But in when, many ways, it's easier for them now because there's very little con constituency for voting for the other party's nominees. The only lasting solution to what ails our body juridic is to return to the Founders Constitution by rebalancing and devolving power so Washington isn't making so many decisions for the whole country. Depoliticizing and toning down our confirmation process is a laudable goal, but that'll only happen when judges go back to judging rather than bending over backwards to ratify the constitutional abuses of the other branches. The judiciary needs to once again hold politicians and bureaucrats feet to the constitutional fire by rejecting overly broad legislation of dubious constitutional warrant, thus curbing executive agency overreach and putting the ball back in Congress's court, and by returning power back to the states and the people while ensuring that majorities on the local level don't invade individual constitutional rights. After all, the separation of powers and federalism exists not as some dry exercise in Madisonian political theory, but as a means to that singular end of protecting our freedom. These structural protections are the framers best stab at answering the eternal question of how you empower government to secure liberty while also building internal controls for self-policing. Or as Madison famously put it in Federalist 51, his disquisition on man's non-angelic nature, quote, in framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed and in the next place, oblige it to control itself. Ultimately, judicial power is not a means to an end, but an enforcement mechanism for the strictures of a founding document intended just as much to curtail the excesses of democracy as to empower its exercise. In a country ruled by law and not men, the proper response to an unpopular legal decision is to change the law or amend the constitution. Any other method leads to a sort of judicial abdication and the loss of those very rights and liberties that can only be vindicated through the judicial process or to government by black-robed philosopher kings. And as Justice Scalia liked to say, why would we choose nine lawyers for that job? 
The reason we have heated court battles is that the federal government is simply making too many decisions at a national level for such a large, diverse, pluralistic country. There's no more reason there needs to be a one size fits all health care system, for example, than that zoning laws be uniform in every city. So let federal legislators make the hard calls about truly national issues like defense or actually interstate actual commerce, but let states and localities make most of the decisions that affect our daily lives. Let Texas be Texas and California be California. That's the only way we're going to diffuse tensions in Washington, whether in the halls of Congress or in the marble palace of the highest court in the land. So thanks very much for having me again and I'm happy to answer or dodge any questions that you might have.